Om. Peace, love, harmony, beauty, namaste to you. Thank you again for joining me, MXGDML, here for yet another installment where we talk about taxes, funding, war, and the fact that you and I and the world has killed a Yemeni mother. How does that make you feel? <sighs> like we need to take a moment here to understand our place in the universe, in the galaxy, in the solar system, in the globe, and wonder about so many things. Ah. <sighs> May this space now carry a clean energy to receive and to be accepting of new information and new teachings, uh, new things you didn't know. You learn something new every day. And we're gonna dive right back into the Invisible Committee's book, The Coming Insurrection. Again, this book is about France and their details in history. However, it is still applicable. And this chapter is called, We Are Building a Civilized Space Here. The first global slaughter, which from 1914 to 1918 did away with a large portion of the urban and rural proletariat, was waged in the name of freedom, democracy, and civilization. For the past years, the so-called War on Terror with its special operations and targeted assassinations has been pursued in the name of these same values. Yet the resemblance stops there, at the level of appearances. The value of civilization is no longer so obvious that it can be brought to the natives as a package. Freedom is no longer a name scrawled on walls, for today it is always followed as if by its shadow with the word security. And it is well known that democracy can be dissolved in pure and simple emergency edicts. For example, in the official reinstitution of torture in the United States, or in France's Parabin II law. In a single century, freedom, democracy, and civilization have reverted to the state of hypothesis. The leaders' work from now on consists in shaping the material and moral as well as symbolic and social conditions in which these hypotheses can be more or less validated in configuring spaces where they can seem to function. All means to these ends are acceptable, even the least democratic, the least civilized, the more repressive, the better. It was a century in which democracy regularly presided over the birth of fascist regimes. Civilization constantly rhymed to the tune of Wagner or Iron Maiden with extermination, and in which one day in 1929, freedom showed its two faces, a banker throwing himself from a window and a family of workers dying of hunger. Since then, let's say since 1945, it's taken for granted that manipulating the masses, secret service operations, the restriction of public liberties, and the complete sovereignty of a wide array of police forces were appropriate ways to ensure democracy, freedom, and civilization. At the final stage of this evolution, we see the first socialist mayor of Paris putting the finishing touches on urban pacification with a new police protocol for a poor neighborhood, announcing with the following carefully chosen words, quote, we are building a civilized space here, end quote. There's nothing more to say. Everything has to be destroyed. Wow, very French, very resistive and protesting. <laughs> Let's get on the road and talk about my favorite thing, taxes. We got the tax man, yeah, yeah, way on the tax man. Welcome to Rush Hour. It's five o'clock here on the streets of LA. And what better time and place than to drive your vehicle and spread a message to the people around you. Bus drivers, taxi drivers, car drivers, bicyclists, even passers-by. Pedestrians will get a glimpse of taxes fund war again. But what can they do when tax season rolls around? When April 18th, 2017 comes, there are ways in which you can categorize your money and it matters. And you can partake in this by being a tax resistor. That's what it's called. Quick little history lesson. Between the 1860s and 1950s, tax resistors claimed that the taking of their hard-earned monies was legal larceny, propagated by a system that was motivated through class hatred and a enforcement process that was illegal espionage. Nowadays, there are different methods and repercussions to acting out these dormant views with different risks and direct, non-direct action. 
I just got a thumbs up from a woman walking with her daughter. She just threw one of these right on her side that wasn't carrying a bag. One, boom, walking down the street. You rock, ma'am. You're one of the few who have given me that message because sometimes it's hard to tell if people are even paying attention. So in researching all of this, I came across a website. And this is where a lot of the information came from. Thank you to the National War Resistance Coordinating Committee. I'll have a link to their website and all of that description, of course. They talk about direct and non-direct action. What they do is set up a website with organizing bodies, links, descriptions of tax resistance, consequences thereof, and then ways that you can resist, and then stories of, about people who have resisted and what they have gone through. It's a really good, informative website. Definitely check it out. Like I said, there are direct and non-direct ways of tax resistance. And if you want to go non-direct, that would be not having to change your lifestyle or alter the filings of your tax returns, you can protest. One thing you can do is send a letter of protest with your 1040 tax form. Don't staple it, but enclose a letter with your filings that tells the tax collectors about your discomfort and dis-ease and the unjust and misappropriated spending of our monies. You can definitely do that. If you pay your taxes and when you pay your taxes, you can write a message on the checks that shows your protest as well different messages, anything you want about how you do not support this whole system. You can also pay your taxes in hundreds of small denomination checks or coins. You can make it very difficult for people who have to take your monies. You can lobby for a peace fund legislation which would allow conscientious objectors to pay into a fund their taxes that would not be used for war. There's going to be more information on that specifically and other things in a subsequent episode of this series, so stay tuned for that. So that's the non-direct action, and if you want to directly take resistance to taxes, there are four different methods that I'll describe. And before we even start, you basically have to owe money at the end of the year meaning that you are under withheld and that when you fill out your W-2s, you should claim more than two dependents, two or more actually, on line five, making you liable for this specific form of resistance. On your 1040 form, you could refuse to pay a portion or a percentage of your taxes. You can delineate a amount in dollars or a percentage amount based on parameters that kind of mirror or parallel your beliefs, such as the dollar amounts. You could withhold 5, 10, 30, 50 dollars, or you could withhold a percentage of your income from your taxes. And these delineations could be in, for example, these next three percentages. 3% of the monies you could withhold because that is the money spent on the prolonged military occupations in our global war on terror. You could withhold 27% of your taxes because that number is what is slated to be used in military expenditures. Or let's say you want to withhold 45% of your taxes because that is going to be the overall expenditure on a government level for our military in general. Of course, there are risks to this, and I will list them here. For one, the IRS can issue a series of warnings to you. Two, the IRS could add penalties on the amount that you owe, but only up to 25% because after that they'll stop. Either because the statute of limitations would expire on your tax debt, or by that point they will have acquired your monies. They may also eventually seize what you owe by attaching your bank account, or asking your employer to reallocate some of your salary to them, or in some rare cases actually seizing some property. Ooh, this stretch of road is no bueno for filming. Here we go. This one's so bad. Oh. So in those scenarios, that's only if you refuse to pay a portion. Now, if you refuse to file your taxes entirely, here's what also could happen. Again, the threats and penalties and interests by the IRS will come flowing into your life and it'll be scary, and you won't know what to do, and you think it's gonna all be over. It's not, uh, but there are more things on the way. The IRS may take action for a tax assessment on their own account, and sometimes this will amount to more than what you would have owed because they don't take into account deductions that you may qualify for. Plus, you gotta remember there's no statute of limitations for those who do not file their taxes, so there is no 25% cap on the interest and penalties that you will incur. 
Also, if you do not file your taxes, you will probably be at risk of losing some benefits to federal programs such as the Affordable Care Act or any student financial aid program. Also, this website talks about a third option, which is living below the income tax threshold. Basically, making a yearly salary of $10,300 or less, which amounts to under the poverty line. And if you live this way, there are certain risks that, of course, come with that. There's the financial insecurity and the uncertainty of just life's situations that will be thrown at you and not being able to pay for all of it. Really, it's all about money. Like, some people are are not obligated to certain things in life, so they could adjust their whole outlook on living, but others have obligations in life, and a lot of us are just driven by money and the need to acquire, so this is not going to be as viable an option for some people. The fourth option is actually quite interesting and unknown. If you have a landline in the United States, you can withhold the federal excise tax or federal tax on your statement because that tax has traditionally been used for military spending. Its inception was actually the Spanish-American War in 1898. It was repealed and reinstated multiple times until 1932 when a 20% per call price was set. In 1941, the tax was applied to local services, not just long distance services or long distance telephone calls, and that rate was set at 6%. The tax was actually written to be phased out by 1969, but the Vietnam War was taking place, so the extension of the tax warranted a maintenance of 10% during that time period to increase and supply the military budget with what it needed. Fast forward a few years to the 1980s when the tax was actually used to pad the federal treasury, but it seems pretty obvious that it was really being reallocated to the military spending and budget of the Reagan administration. Time for a quick tax fact. Between 1966 and 2001, the federal excise tax on telephone services amounted to $89 billion! What? And jumping back into the timeline to more recent years, in 2006, the federal excise tax on long distance telephone services was actually abolished. As of now, the tax no longer applies to long distance, mixed use phone services like cell phones, flat rate telephones, or internet phone calls. None of that. It only applies to local domestic calls. I mean, isn't that fascinating then? Inter-business telephone conversations between different shops that you patron are paying for military expenditures. So that's a wonderful way that you can take that power back and say, I ain't gonna pay that federal tax, Mr. Telephone Service Bill. Mm -mm -mm. However, there are risks to that. Telephone companies might see that and interpret it to mean that you are not paying any of your bill, so they may shut down your service. So it will be good to look at the link provided in the description of this video to see just what you need to do step by step if you choose to partake in these tax resistance methods. And in the second part, we're going to talk about redirection of your taxes and where the monies can go and what those services actually are, local funds and trusts and programs to help people who are resisting and people like yourself who choose to resist because you can be a tax resistor too. April 15th is actually the tax march in Washington, three days before filing your taxes on April 18th. Make sure that you look into what you can do, take back your money, taxes fund war, it's a thing, I killed the Yemeni mother, I can't even take it anymore, I need to do something, I'm... I'm as mad as hell and I'm not gonna take this anymore! He's wondering what else do you think would go into teaching people about resistance and activism in general? Three paragraph response. First of all, I don't think you should mislead people. You should get them to understand that if they're going to be independent thinkers, they are probably going to pay a cost. I mean, one has to begin with an understanding of the way the world works. The world does not reward honesty and independence. It rewards obedience and service. It's a world of concentrated power, and those who have power are not going to reward people who question that power. So to begin with, I don't think anybody should be misled about that. After you understand that, okay, then you make your own choices. If your choice is that you want to be an independent anyhow, even though you recognize what's involved, then you should just go ahead and try to do it. But those can be extremely hard choices sometimes. For instance, 
I know that as an older person who often gets approached by younger people for advice, I'm always very hesitant to give it on these sorts of decisions, even though sometimes the circumstances are such that I have to, because I am in no position to tell anybody else what to decide. But what I think one can do is to help people understand that the objective realities are these. Look, there's a lot to be gained by activism, like all of you were saying earlier, but there are also many things that you can lose. And some of those things are not unimportant, like security, for example. That's not unimportant. And people just have to make their own choices about that when they decide what they're going to do. Yes, that's true. And can you make those hard decisions? Are you at a time in your life where you can make these choices? Is there a direct, non-direct route which you foreseeably see yourself participating in? If you can, if you should, if you think you could, do it. There is solidarity in this group organization. There is a reactive set of pressure that we bring to the institutions that listen to what we do. Our actions do not go unwarranted or unseen. And hey, have a wonderful time doing those taxes. <laughs> Uh, easier said than done.